It was good to do, and it's good to be here at Crown as well. So let's get into the footy news. I know before you mentioned uh, the Barassi family has accepted the Andrews government's offer for a state funeral. The question is, is Ron Barassi's life MCG worthy? Should it be an MCG state funeral? It's hard to say no, isn't it? I think it's hard to say no. Jared, thoughts? Yeah, no, I'm with you. Yeah, Shane Warne, Ron Brassy, there's similar ilk on different sports. Mm. Admittedly, not a global sport, but I think it makes sense. I would have thought. Now, from an AFL perspective, the AFL management team met this morning, and one of the key dis- discussion items was how to honour the legend of Ron Brassy. There's universal desire to do something. It's just how it materialises. So the Premiership Cup being named after Brassy is one thing that's been out there. We know that. Another option is to uh, rename each premiership medal the Ron Barassi medal or the Barassi medal. So if you're a premiership player, instead of winning a premiership medal, you win a Barassi medal. That's one of the things that was put forward this morning. And the third scenario is renaming AFL House Barassi House. So there's three options there, and there could be one, there could be two, there could be three that be adopted. Either way, it needs commission approval and there's no reason why this can't take place before the grand final, but they've got to get moving if it's going to happen. Mm. What are your initial thoughts on that? Of those three, I think the Premiership Cup being renamed after Ron Barassi. Jared, of, of those, the medals, the I'm, Cup or AFL House? I'm a medals man. You're a medals yeah, man? Yeah, I like the idea of getting a Barassi medal for mm. winning a flag because that's uh, why he made his name. I mean, you get the Cup, you could do that, but... Um Certainly, I'd rule out the house, the mm, Barassi house. I don't think that's going to get up. And then it's probably one or the other two. Mm. All right, we might put a Twitter poll up and you can vote on those three options and which is best befitting of Ron Barassi. Ash, we talk about some trade news? Let's do that. Marvio Troll, he's been on the lips of many list managers around the country because of his availability. He's got two years left on a, on a contract. Kicked five goals, four for Gold Coast in the VFL on the weekend. They're into a VFL grand final. It is very early days. I know the Herald Sun's reported that the Brisbane Lions are inter- interested. I can also tell you today that Adelaide is interested in Marbio Troll as well. Um, the Crows know they can get him for not very much in terms of a trade. It's just about how the money works and whether potentially he could be part of a play to get pick four as well if they can take Marbio Troll's money off the Gold Coast Suns. Uh, Riley Thilthorpe, the thrill seeker. Why would uh, they be chasing him? Well, I know Riley O'Brien is, um, yeah, he's not young, but yeah, so your child and Thilthorpe doesn't quite make sense. Uh, to and them. and Fogarty and Walker as well. Yeah. So they would be thinking, okay, we're losing McAdam, who's going to yeah, Melbourne. Different players. Can right? he play the role that McAdam was playing as a third floating tall? But it's surplus to their needs for me. Yeah. All, all I've heard reported is that Adelaide want a replacement for McAdam, not, not draft pick. So yeah. maybe it's tied up in that deal as Even well. Even the but Lions is an interesting one. Yeah, because I think that too. They've got Joe Danaher, who was struggling as a full forward, who really has had a terrific season. I reckon he was stiff to miss out in the All-Australian as a ruck forward option, freeze him up. Now, maybe you could have two of those in the one side. Um, you know, if they think they're a bit short down there, well, that's okay. But uh, there'd be plenty of clubs chasing him. All does does Damien Harbick not rate him? Is that, what we're, is that what we're seeing? So why would Hardwick want to trade him? Wouldn't he come in with a fresh approach and say, look, new coach, yep. new atmosphere, this is how I see your role going? I think there's an acknowledgement that when they get the young academy kid in and they've got Lukosius, uh, they've got Ben King, they've got Levi Kasbolt going around again, they don't want someone running around the VFL of that age with two years remaining on a contract who is on reasonable money. Mm. Which brings us to Grundy, who's been running around the VFL for yeah. a period of time. Obviously, there was a falling out of sorts. Uh, anything more to add to that? No, as, as I said this morning, this is just a formality. This will, yeah. this will get done now. No, but that's not the point. We know it's going to get done. Yeah. The, the question is, why wasn't he playing on the weekend? That is the great question, Jared, and I don't know the answer to that. But it did cause some questions to be asked at Melbourne Football Club between assistant coaches and players. There, was a li- there were questions asked. And even Josh Shackey's parents couldn't understand why Josh Shackey was sub and didn't get on the ground. So there is this sort of cloud of confusion around why this decision was made. Well, I can understand why he didn't get on the ground if they thought Max was going well. But ultimately, fresh legs would have been significant. I mean, it certainly helped Carlton. It was mm. only one battle. Mm. It was only one contest. Mm. But those fresh legs, you could see when Lockie Hunter got uh, dragged down, 
I don't think he holds on if he uh, hasn't got the fresh legs. There must be something more to it. There, there has to be. I'm, I don't know about conspiracies or you know, how Brody's been around the club. I don't, I don't know. All, all I'm thinking is there must be more to him just being overlooked. There well, must be more to the story. Well, the here. language changed very quickly. It went from we're supporting Brody. We love him. Well, he's part of our culture. He's part of our team. It's, we're a, mature, di- it's a mature club. To we'll deal with that at the end of the season. Mm. It, cha- it flipped in a week. Yeah. And I, I would love to know what happened in that week internally. I said this morning, Jared, you'd remember because you spoke about it, Mason Cox coming on in that Brisbane game yeah. as a sub yeah. and the way that he turned the game, turned it. how hungry he was, went into the ruck. That's what Grundy would have done. Yeah. Late in the third quarter, put him in the ruck, put Gorn forward, he'd taken two contested marks inside 50. Grundy's going to be hungry to get after him, cause carnage, cause chaos. That's what they missed. Even if it was a sub, I couldn't believe he wasn't in the 22. But to, to put Josh Shackey... Josh Shackey in front of a two-time All-Australian, Brody Grundy, is, is bizarre. To put McDonald in front of Grundy is, as I said last week, is also bizarre. So uh, I'm not sure. that was a, It was a bad one from Melbourne. They would say, look, we should have won the game anyway. We yep. had the opportunities to do so. If it wasn't for a couple of bounces of the ball, we would have done that. But in the end, that was, that was a poor one. And there's a few things that they need to deal with Melbourne, Jared. Part of it is their discipline and how that completely broke down. 50-metre penalties. The reversal of free kicks, Pickett yep. and Sparrow and Clayton Oliver not knowing the rules and giving another 50 away and Cozzy Pickett trying to, mm. you know, coat, a coat hanger everyone. Yep. I, I got a week for that. Couldn't Well, not that one. He got a week for the Crips one, but what about the one on, on McGovern as well? He should have got a week for that as well. So, yeah, they had a complete meltdown, uh, the Melbourne Football Club, unfortunately. Now, let's move on to some other trade targets. One of those is Ben Mackay. Ben Mackay. We're waiting on his decision. We don't know where it's going to be because the Sydney Swans are still confident. Essendon is still confident. Hawthorne is still confident. Normally, at this time of the year, this time of the process, one of those clubs sort of thinks, ah, maybe it's not us, starts looking at other players. I know the Swans have had a look at Tom Dude and are still considering him as a backup option. But all three clubs still think that Harry Mackay is coming to them. Um, sorry, Ben Mackay. So we're waiting for a, a scenario. It was always going to eventuate after the best and fairest. That was Saturday night, and we still don't know an answer. Um, whatever it is, it'll get North Melbourne pick three. They're not going to be matching it. They're not going to be forcing a trade. Um, they'll get pick three from this, and that's a pretty good result for How them, good for North. given that he finished seventh in their best and fairest. Yeah, and was beaten by Taron Thomas, which is, which is amazing. Yeah. You mentioned Tom Duday. What's the latest? So Adelaide's none the wiser as whether Duday will re-sign or go to Brisbane. But the Swans' in, uh, interest has been rekindled a little bit, which is the only reason that makes me think that mm, maybe they know that Ben Mackay is not going there. Uh, Tom Duday, I think if he leaves Adelaide, will get to Brisbane. But the Swans' interest is still there. It still exists under the surface. They're looking for What a, about this one? Go on. Marbio Chol, go and get him. Are the Swans? And put McDonald in the back line. Mm. Can McDonald play defence? Don't know, but I don't Let's know too, I don't know too <laughs> many centre half forwards that don't go better when they when they go to centre half back. The Swans are also targeting an inside mid. What inside mid would you try to get from around the league? Well, how many are available? So Matt Crouch would have been ideal. Yeah. It wouldn't have cost much. Would you much, go after Ollie Wines? Um, probably not. I think it cost you a bit much, and he's got a long-term deal at Port Adelaide, which is always makes years. it a bit more problematic. Well, you mentioned James Jordan this morning from Melbourne. Free agent. Does he do the job for them, though? Well, I don't know. I'm, who else does? Who's out yeah. there? Parrish is re-signed. Uh, there's a couple of clubs, including Geelong, that would be you know, interested as well. So, yeah. yeah. Jack Steele would be one that if I was the Saints, I'd be, try- I'd, week, be to, I'd be trying to shop him around, so I'd be putting him on the table if I was the Saints. Well, they're going to See if the Swans were interested in him. They're going to get Grundy. They're looking for a key defender and an inside mid, and they're trying to do it quickly, the Sydney Swans. They don't want to wait another 12 months because if you remember last off-season, they made very few list changes. They just backed their organic growth. It didn't quite work this year, even though they played finals. Um, I just want to put so you're one... saying that was a mistake, Tom? Yeah, I am. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's that. I don't think it's rocket, scientist, rocket science to say that they didn't do enough in the off-season to improve this year. Hmm. Um, I want to put this name on the table. Dylan Shield. I just want to put it on the radar. He's got a year to go in his deal at Essendon. He's well paid. Is he better off somewhere else for him, for Essendon? And if so, where would that be, do you think? I'd have to have a think about which club he would be suited to, but they haven't used him in the role that they need to use him in, and that is as an inside midfielder. Think Stephen Canelio and the yep. role he's playing and getting him back to his best. That is what whoever he goes to, if it's Essendon, if he stays or if he goes... He needs to get back to doing that, and that will start not as a half forward. No, I'm with you. I, he, he played it. Was it the second half of last year where he came? Uh, he was dropped, and he came back. His last half of last year was 
was A grade. He was back to his very best. I'm not sure what happened this year. Hodgie, welcome in. Good afternoon, guys. Look, uh, it's finally here. Prelim final. We're down to down to four. And look, Kane, who uh, who would have thought that at round 12 this year, where GWS is sitting 15th spot, they go on to win 13 of the next 15, and coming up Friday night against Collingwood. And then you look at the other side of it, and in round 15 this year, Carlton was sitting on 15th. And they've gone to win 11 of the next 12. It's amazing how footy can turn around if you get the right mix, the right belief, and the right coaching and players. It is incredible, Jared, isn't it? Like, we just wouldn't <laughs> even thunk it to think this would be well, the case. Well, there's a big difference between the Giants and the Blues, I reckon, because the Giants' numbers looked like they were playing the right way. And Hoyne was saying all through the year that, like, you know, they've, they've lost a number of close games, and they were only losing close games. But you could see method, the method was good. But the giant, the Blues were the complete opposite. They were, they were, they were really poor. They were going backwards. They were going slow. They'd lost all confidence. But they they turned around incredibly well. I mean, the the Blues turn around, I think, was more unlikely than the Giants mm. winning all those games mm. in a row because the Giants had worked on their method, whereas Carlton changed theirs midway through the season, and that's hard to do. What's your advice for the players playing in a prelim for the first time, Hodgie, or maybe not for the first time, about this weekend? Because you can actually, for the first time, touch it. You get one more win, and we are going to experience the best week of our life, but it still seems reasonably far away. You're spot on. It's it's one of the more nervy. Out of all um, rounds or finals, prelims are the one I hate the most because you know that if you don't succeed... You're sitting there watching two teams play off the next week. Uh, and if you do, it's a big build-up into a grand final with the parade and everything else that you're, you're going to experience. But it's it's trying to block out. And, and you, you've got a picture. Look at GWS. So they're going to come up against a mighty uh, Collingwood Football Club on Friday night. There might be, there might be 92, 93, 94,000 there. 90,000 of those are going to be Collingwood. You mentioned before, Kane, that prelim is the last real supporters game. Uh, if you look back at 217 when Richmond beat GWS. Uh, I, I had an uncle go to that, and he said it's the loudest he's ever heard a crowd just because yep. it was so one-sided. And I feel that's what we're going to, to get on Friday night. So for the Giants, they need, they, they need to block it out. Uh, Collingwood are going to ride a, the emotion with, with, their, uh, with their supporters, but GWS has just got to try and jump on them early, block it out early, and if they can get on top and quieten down the crowd. Psychologically, it's only a memory, Hodgie. I'm not sure if it's stack up to uh, statistical analysis, but grand finals we often see blowouts. Somebody gets on top. The you know the 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 big A falls out of a various club. Psychologically, they're beaten, and the, the premiers run on for a, a good win. In, in prelim finals, it's often the reverse. It is just dog eat dog dog fight to the last second, and often it seems that the side that has the hardest victory in the prelim final goes on to win the flag. Yeah, you're spot on. I know in a lot of our finals, prelim finals, I think in 2012 we beat Adelaide by four or five points. Uh, 2013 we yep. beat Geelong by five, beat Port Adelaide by three points. Um, you're right. I always felt that the best build-up for a grand final was that hard-fought victory because you yep. don't get ahead of yourself. If you go and win by 50 or 60 points, you're sitting there, you mm. don't go through the game as closely as if you're just get over the line because you want to make sure you don't that you don't leave it within a kick for that next week. So a, a perfect build up for, for teams is injury free, of course, but also it's a hard fought victory because you don't want blokes relaxing and getting ahead of himself going in before a massive crowd uh, on grand final because you know that re- things don't go your way. Look at Sydney last year. I reckon when the Pies won um, their last flag, Luke Ball for memory kicked a goal in late in the prelim final. Was that against you guys? Hodgie? Didn't have to bring that up. I was going to bring it up against Port Adelaide with Kane. But, you know, that was against us. That was Luke Ball. <laughs> okay, sorry. Luke, Luke Ball can't kick over 40 metres with a drop punt, and somehow he kicked a snap for 45 metres to, uh, yeah. to put him through into a grand final. Yeah, from a stoppage. Little things just add up, don't yeah. they? But uh, the Pies went on and won a close grand final. It was uh, quite an- amazing. But, All right, let's talk you, about you, the fallout you, you from... It, sorry, Kane, I was just saying, you look at the, that build-up... The, Collingwood and, and Sydney had a really good prelim final last year. Sydney just got over yep. the line and then and then they get blown yep. away. So I guess if you're a Geelong supporter, you're saying that doesn't happen every year, I guess. No, that's right, yep. If you want to have your say, you can on the Harcourts open line, one 736 736 Hodgie and us are more than happy to take a call from you. Let's talk about the fallout for the two teams that went out in straight sets. Hodgie, and you've got some thoughts on Port Adelaide and perhaps what they could have done differently. 
Yeah, I, I sat back and, and was watching, and what, what I did notice was Hogan uh, on McKenzie. He had, he had eight shots at goal, kicked four goals, kicked four mm. points, um, and they kept McKenzie on him for the whole game. I would have thought when you've got other options down there, I know that Alir Alir was getting... Um, Oh, he was getting, oh, I think it was Keith going uh, on a forward defensive role on him to try and limit his impact for dropping off. But Kane, probably looking at you, is could they have moved someone else across to Hogan? Because you saw what he did. Once he's up and about and he's feeling good, you saw what he did against Essendon when he kicked the nine goals. Um, they stuck with McKenzie, but it, the matchup just clearly was in, in Hogan's favour. Yeah, McKenzie was on one leg, wasn't he? You could see that. He, you know, he's limping around and holding on and. Um was outside, so the, the only option would have been Ali. I actually thought Ali played pretty well, and he, he was the only one that was saving the day at times with the amount of inside 50s going against them. Other than that, I, I'm just not sure there's another option. So you could have done that, and Ali could have played a more defensive role, but then you lost his intercepting ability, and McKenzie would have had to have played on Riccardi. He still would have been outsized, and Riccardi probably would have got a hold of him. So the, the issue for them is you go into a season, you've got one defender above the height of 190. So good luck. Like good luck yeah. when you come up against two key forwards in a big final when your midfield gets smashed and you've got that many entries coming your way. It was the same with Burton on Toby Green. Like that, they had to wait before they could change that matchup as well. He was getting torched. And, Why did they have to wait? Well, because you've got Bergman as the only other option yeah. and he's the one that actually looked good setting them up. The only time Port Adelaide looked threatening was with their ball movement from okay. the back half when, that, when yeah. they got ahead of them. And, and that was, you know on the back of Alir and, and Bergman with the intercepting mark. So, look, Ken Hinckley will bear the brunt of this, and, and rightly so, because that's what you do as a coach, and that's the, you know, that's the reality when you've been there for a long time and you, you haven't had the success in finals. But it's all in for Port Adelaide. That, they need to look at their list management and go, how could we have gone in with one Ruckman, who is a veteran and probably in his last year? How can we only have one key forward, Charlie Dixon, and that hurt them? And how can you possibly have one key defender above the, the height of 190? So... That, that, that it's an all-in, I think, review for Port Adelaide and how it got to this point and, and a bit of a waste in the end, Hodgie. It is amazing, that, Hodgie, though, your frailties get exposed in uh, the big finals and the, fur the further you go into the finals, the more you get exposed. I mean, the Swans were a classic example last year where their, their midfield stuff was uh, OK, ball movement got through, got them all the way through to a grand final and yet by quarter time... They were just beaten up literally in the middle of the ground by a much bigger and, uh, and, and more dynamic Geelong. Well, that, well, that's what teams do. You get to this top point time of the year and you're trying to pick out the flaws in, in opposition teams. And, and clearly, Kane, uh, Port last year, they, they went after Radigalia and that's why they're, they're still hard at yep. Radigalia and Zerk Thatcher to try and make up for the, for the downfall that they've got in their, in their back six. But uh, people are sort of saying, would you, would you, should they have rethought about the option of Ken Hinkley. I still think Ken has done a fantastic job. Ken and the coaching staff, considering uh, where they were, was it 15th or 16th last year? Oh, no, sorry, it was 11th. It was 11th yep. they've jumped up into a top they're four. 11th, so, they lost their first five. Yeah, and, and that's you sort of sit back and go, that's still a massive increase from an improvement from, from a time, from a side that was, was sitting 11th at the end of the season last year. So I feel that, yes, though, it was a, it's a disappointing way to go out in, in straight sets and you feel terrible as players and coaches. But to, for people to sort of doubt if they made the right decision, I reckon that's a bit far-fetched. Mm. One of the, the people that was sort of barracking against them this year was their former captain, Warren Treadray. He has spoken, Tom. You've got the update? Yeah, he spoke today, just a few hours ago. Warren Treadray said there needs to be someone that pays the price, a president, a coach, someone off the field has to pay the price. Port fans, Port fans want blood. Mm. What's your response to that? Well, I think that's I think that's right. Port fans have wanted blood for a long time. I think for for Warren's solution though was for Josh Carter to be the coach. Warren's been pushing really hard for his good mate and, and former teammate Josh Carter to be the coach. But this is my point on it being all in because Josh Carr is the midfield coach. Mm. The midfield had nine goals from stoppage kicked against them. The midfield was the biggest issue on the night with minus 17 in clearances. So I just don't think that's going to solve everything. Just putting Josh Carr in the chair would be Warren's solution. But I think Josh needs some responsibility. As much as he's highly rated and will eventually be the coach, but he probably had a poor night mm. as well. So uh, there's, that, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an all-in approach. Well, <laughs> they, the yeah, Brisbane exactly Lions right. 13 goals from, from Stoppies yeah, last week them. as well. But it, he's, 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 actually doing the, oh, yeah. he's actually doing the day, the game day coaching while Ken's been down on the bench, almost like the Adam Uzo with Goodwin down on the bench, isn't it? So he's effectively still leading um, him that way. Well, yeah, I, I guess he's you know yeah, very he heavily involved in strategy. Um, 
I'm not sure. You would, you would think the, the other coaches have a fair say as well up in the box, but um, I think Port fans think Josh Carr's the coach when they win and Ken Hinckley's the coach yeah. when they lose. That, that seems as to be the way. As is often the case yeah. with this situation. The players get the uh, accolades when you win. The coach cops it in the neck if you, <laughs> if you lose. I'm with you, Hodgie. I think uh, Ken Hinckley's had a fantastic season. Obviously, uh, some... Issues with injury exposed what was already a weakness, and uh, they fell apart. I mean, I think looking at their midfield, I mean, sometimes you just get to a finals. Unless you've got another genuine A-grade rotation, you can get to a finals campaign, and you're out of steam. Mm. I mean, their, their three guns, their best, probably their worst games, they were, weren't they? were the finals. Yeah. And, you know, if they've, had to work, if they've had to work in the red zone for the majority of the season to get into the finals, maybe they just ran out of juice because there's, there's not a second wave coming to support them. So as much as everyone wants to fix up their back line, that group of midfielders need to also have some, uh, have some backup and rest so they can, uh, they, they can hit the finals full steam ahead rather than just sort of falling into the finals. Well, that's been the thing on the, the Giants, Hodge, is, is the midfield is, has been the last part of their game to really click in. And, and to Jared's point about the numbers that they've got going through there, like Ward is playing really good football. Yeah. Uh, he's played really good football for a long time, but he seems to have hit his straps finals. Canelio back into the side and what he's been able to do. Josh Kelly, career best form. Green is just emerging as a, a budding superstar. Then you've got the runners off the half back and, and Phil on the Cal- wings. Cal- Phil, Cal- Phil Cal- uh, Finn Callahan has been... Finn Callahan. You know, starting to feel really comfortable at yeah. the level as well. So, I don't know. You can never have too many midfielders, Hodgie. No, Ollie Wines, how's, uh, with, with the yeah. names that you've got with Port Adelaide, and we spoke about this last week with, with Butters, uh, Drew, uh, Rosie, Horn Francis. It seems like Ollie Wines was, mm. was put on the app. So, his last two finals got uh, very, very few um, centre clearances last week with the Drew Tag and Lockie Neal. And then he only has 16 touches this week. Is that trying to fit him into a midfield where they're... He's, a, he's obviously a bigger body, slower player where they want speed and, and agility through there. Yeah, well, if you're not... If he's not playing as an inside midfielder, for me, he doesn't play. Like, that, that, that's the reality of it. Like, he, he's not a wingman. So, you know, they played him on a wing and he, you know, selfishly played that role. But you're right. You're trying to force him into something that he's not and he's won a Brownlow and all of that. But if he's not inside and if Drew has gone past him, then to Tom Morris's point before, there's clubs looking for an inside midfielder. You would explore and he should explore other opportunities for him because you're not going to get the best out of him. And that could be a win-win for player and club and send him to a club that needs an inside midfielder because he's not, he's not going to play on a wing. Especially when Port Adelaide Hodgie need a draft pick back. They want to get back into the draft and even use that to get a Sava Radagalia or a Brandon Zerk Thatcher. Ollie Wine still has three years remaining on a deal, but like Tom Mitchell, he's a recent Brownlow medalist that you're saying is one-dimensional and good at that dimension, but doesn't play anywhere else. Yeah, it's like playing Patrick Cripps on a wing. It's not going to happen. That's, that's it now. Pat Cripps is a better player than Wines, but it's the same role. And but surely the rotation, the you've got to have the numbers. Why give away an A-grade player to then try and rebuild? There must be a way where they can rotate more and have guys freshen up without exposing him to the wing. Mm, yeah, perhaps. Um, and and Boak would be the other one that they need to make a hard... I yep. think they've made that call on, on Travis Boak, so we'll wait and see how that goes he, down. He said, he said they haven't today. So okay. he was door-stopped after his exit interview, and he said those conversations are still ongoing. But you'd expect that to be done in the next 48 hours. I would, sure, I surely they've had chats before be that. A, if yeah, you're, if Travis would be acutely aware... You're right, Hodgie. You'd be acutely aware of where he sits in and amongst the club, and respectfully, they're probably... You know, hoping that he makes the call that the club hopes that he will make. And the other one is Orazio Fantasia, who was also door stopped, and he said there'll be a deal for him on the table next year as well at Port Adelaide. Right. Probably a short term deal. Let's move on to the other club that's gone out in straight sets for the second time in a row. That's the D's, Hodgie. We've already discussed the debacle of having Josh Shackey as a sub. What was your thoughts? Still trying to, still trying to understand the process. Um, clearly, they went in. You, you, you can't go into a, a final with the thought process as a sub, if, if your forward line doesn't work properly, you've got to have someone who's going to come in, bang for buck, and play obviously both ends, which Shaqie can, but they they had no intention of bringing him on. It was it was a, a safe play to put him there just in case McDonald got injured, but I know you, you look at when Hollands came on, he gave him a spark, had four or five touches, mm. was in the play that got him the winning goal. Um, I, I feel that they'll be sitting back stewing on, on the decision they made was, was clearly the wrong one. But it, it, it goes back to... The decision that Mel would have made all the way back to, to the trade, you look at what Collingwood brought into their side. Bobby Hill, 
Woody McStay, people that they needed to fill voids to make him a competitive top four team. Melbourne went in there and, and tried to outsmart and get the best ruckman to join Max Gorn, who's the other, they're the two dominant ruckmen for, for years. Um, selection then was clearly an incorrect decision considering he's out the window. And then obviously the, it's gone all the way to not trusting him to put him in and play, which I reckon he would have been a more vocal target up, he would have been a better mm. target up forward than, than half the other players that they had in the forward line. Yeah, I uh, I think he was a backup, Jackie, more so for Max Gorn because of his, his Short, toe injury yeah. rather than uh, going forward and going back. But ultimately, I think they needed to roll the dice and make McDonald the backup, whether he was on the bench or put somebody else in, in uh, that gives them some more run. But having having really no backup because you didn't trust him because uh, to go anywhere else because Max Gorn was still hanging in there limited you incredibly. And uh, whatever happened... It's, it's cost them probably the spot uh, in the preliminary final. Whether it uh, costs them the flag, no one is ever going to know. But uh, the, 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 the Grundy issue, Hodgie, when the history of this season is writ, will be uh, one of those big mistakes that just uh, was probably flawed in its conception and uh, certainly failed in its uh, execution. Oh, and, then, and then you get back to... The, oh, I actually didn't mind it to start with. I actually thought, well, they're trying something. They needed a bit of X factor. They tried something, but it is a massive risk bringing in a person that much cash to, to let him sit uh, on the pine watching yeah. while you get kicked out in straight sets. But me personally, if I was a player, I would have been a lot more comfortable having Grundy as full forward, McDonald as the sub, and then at least that way if Maxi needs a, a, a break or he's, he's injured, then you'd have more confidence in yeah. McDonald coming on going forward or back and, and putting Grundy into the ruck. But they've, uh, they've had I mean, their time. They made the, the decision to sit back and stew on it. It begs a question, if Max Gorn had have, uh, got injured, badly injured in this game uh, and Melbourne won, hmm. what happens the following week? Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's where they sit back and look, they bring in Grundy. But uh, I guess that's the, hmm. the fact is, is they're out straight sets. They're going to go back. They're going to sit down and chat to, to Sydney and see what, if they can get the best deal they can for him because they'll need to take the money off the books. Got a couple of texts coming through about the Blues and how you go about taking injured players into finals. Hodgie, you would have lived it. You yourself would have been in situations where you really saw going into a prelim. So we speak of Doherty and Akers and there'd be one or two others. Cripps is sore, not that you wouldn't yep. play him, Tom. Is there anyone else? On, on uh, Wiedering got one to the throat. Yep. Um, no, there's no one else that's sore mm. that I can think of. Uh, Harry Mackay would be the other one as well. Do you bring him back in or not? Hodgie, how many is too many injured players? Uh, it depends on who they are, Kane. There's you, you know yourself. There's <laughs> so oh, Harry, no. Harry Mackay then. <laughs> Harry well, Mackay, Harry, I'll put you on the spot. Ha- he Harry was injured. He was Harry wasn't injured. Well, he's he, in he, doubt. Yeah, uh, he was. He was. He had concussion, so I'm th- pretty sure he's over it. But you, you go so through. So he on plays. This. So he plays in. Uh, I think they'll bring him in. I think for the fact that two talls down there, you saw that Kerno got shut down last week. I reckon they need that second tall. As much as I felt that they looked better. With a smaller agile forward line, I, th- I feel that the pressure they'll be on against the Lions, you need a tall to take up a Harris Andrews. Um, and you don't want them intercept marking and going back the other way. So I think Mackay definitely plays. But but you know yourself, Kane, that when you've, you've, you've got certain teammates that you know you could push through. S- Sam Mitchell was injured. You yeah. knew that whether he, he would give anything to be out in that football field. Um, so you look at a Cripps. Cripps has got those ribs. Had him had that big padding on him for, for a number of weeks. And look at the way he plays. Um, but I guess the, the shoulder ones are a, a different one because Akers did look very sore. He got the number of knocks uh, on Friday night and he looked very, very sore, even though he took the mark and kicked the winning goal. And Doherty, it all depends on how, how he pulled up. There's no doubt they went in there, they've jabbed the shoulder. Um, he probably wouldn't be able to put his mm. arms over his head the first few days, but it all depends on how he pulls up uh, over the next few days if you take that risk with him. Because they're clearly they're going to go into Plenty a of guys who played with uh, big well. injuries and got away with it. I mean, you only have to go back to the Brisbane Lions. Uh, Nigel Lappin had uh, mm. ribs, had the some serious ribs. Uh, Stevens from the Kangaroos, yeah, mm. he had his uh, Steve, ankle. Stevie in. J couldn't walk yeah, in he, the morning of a game yeah, and kicked I mean, five. I think. It's but there's others that don't work. That's true. I mean, it seems to me more the muscular injuries are the ones that uh, become problematic last year. rather than the joint injuries. Yeah, yeah. Reid was because uh, this was a torn quadricep for memory. Mm. Mm. But then you get Stephen May, who evidently had a torn hamstring to some degree, mm. and he played. And uh, and then you got the Joker, who won the Australian Open with a torn hamstring. So <laughs> <laughs> there's exceptions to every rule. All right. Speaking of injuries, Hodgie, what does the Taylor Adams injury do for the Pies? 
Um, I think that just gives clarity that they're going to play Tommy Mitchell more in the midfield. I think he's been mm. – both of them have been trying to share the workload of, of midfield forward for, for the year. Um, and at least the confidence will be there for the coaches knowing that if Tommy Mitchell needs to play 75% midfield, um, then, he's, then he's able to do that. Uh, it means there's more space there for, for Ginnivan, Bobby Hill. They looked really good when they were uh, – the pressure and the speed that they have on in that, in that forward line. So – as much as Adams is a, an important part um, of the jigsaw puzzle, I feel that with the blokes that they've got there, um, I'm pretty sure Tommy can step up. It means you'll have more forwards actually playing their role rather than a midfielder resting forward. Are you worried about Collingwood's form heading into this game? Uh, it, it's a, every, you sort of look back and go, Collingwood have done nothing wrong. Like you, they're, they're finished on top of the ladder. They won their first final. But if you go back from round 20, the, their form with all the stats that... As far as points for, points against, clearances, turnover, the differential compared to the opposition, they don't stack up well. Where if you look at GWS, you would actually, if you didn't look at anything or where the ladder finished, if you look at the two teams in their last, uh, their form since around 20, you'd think that GWS finished on top because of the stats, because of everything that backs up the football that, football that they've been playing. Um, and this, is, this is why it is an arm wrestle on Friday night. Um, Pies are a home game, finished on top of the ladder, have done nothing wrong, but then the form that GWS has brought in um, the momentum, uh, you, you saw what the Bulldogs did in 16. Once you've got that momentum, you've got that belief, you've got that trust that you can win anywhere, it's very hard to stop that momentum. Mm. So we're looking for uh, the headline, Hodge tips the Giants. <laughs> I, I'm still leaning with the pies, but it's uh, okay. the more I've looked into it, I, I, I felt, I, I said the same last week as well, and I was wrong with both games, that the top four teams would win and they both got kicked out. But I, I've, my gut yeah. feel says the pies will be strong enough, but the more I'm looking at, at numbers, the more I'm looking at GWS, their travel, yep. the football they've played the last, as I said, since round 20, um, it, it's getting closer and closer to that game. Well, Jared, last this time last week you tipped the Giants to beat Port Adelaide. Yep. Uh, is it too early to call now? Too or? early to call. Oh, but, uh, last Jared, come last on, week you did it. There's a big, big <laughs> show. <laughs> Twice in the one day. <laughs> Yeah. No, it's, it's great for footy. It's great for those guys because uh, they don't get the pleasure of playing for a, a big club. But, uh, gee, the atmosphere in the rooms, I'm told, uh, where everybody knew everybody, really intimate atmosphere, would have been so rewarding when they'd won through to another preliminary final. So yeah. there's no one, I think, uh, barracks against the Giants, except for maybe Collingwood supporters this week. But... Uh, it's, it's just one of the great efforts for our first-year coach, Hodgie, and I think it's all settled all debates about uh, Coach of the Year. Yeah, I th- well, I think the coaches have to vote on that after round 24. So yeah. um, I, I think if they voted now, I think we all know bringing someone, bringing a team from 16th up into a prelim final is an amazing effort. Uh, but I reckon there's a few other people that might be barracking against them. I think the AFL. The AFL are pleading yeah. for a Carlton mm. Collingwood grand final. As far as growth <laughs> of the game and, and improving of AFL Australia-wide, GWS in Brisbane is the best outcome for that. But as far as a uh, spectator, as far as a crowd, as far as a broadcast in the AFL, they, uh, they're looking for a Carlton Collingwood one for sure.